1898, there was a successful coup d'etat in the United States, in Wilmington, North Carolina, to be exact. Wilmington was a prosperous city where 60% of the inhabitants were black. Like white citizens in Wilmington, black people owned businesses and participated in civic life. In 1898, the mayor, a white man, and the city council, also all white men, supported black people's participation in the city. In the statewide election of 1898, Democrats regained control of North Carolina's government. The campaign had fed on fears of Negro rule and had threatened violence to Republican voters, particularly black Republican voters. Wilmington, however, had re-elected its white Republican, relatively racially progressive mayor. But two days after the election, a group of 500 armed white men marched on Wilmington. They were joined on the way by others. They burned a newspaper owned by black men, not incidentally a newspaper that had recently run an editorial arguing that lynching was criminal and that some charges of rape against black men by white women were covers for consensual sex. The mob killed black citizens. Numbers are still unclear, but probably at least 60. The mob then took over the town government, deposed the mayor and aldermen, instituted a new white democratic mayor and aldermen, and banished many leading African-American community members, including the editorial writer, Alex Manley. Neither the state government nor the federal government intervened. The coup succeeded. The Wilmington coup was part of a larger plan to restore white supremacy to North Carolina. In 1900, North Carolina, in line with many other southern states, passed a new law that did through legislation what the coup had done in Wilmington through violence, banished black people from civic life. Among other things, new laws made voting dependent on payment of a poll tax and passing a test on the Constitution, a test administered and graded by, you guessed it, someone not black. Both stipulations could have hurt poor, uneducated white people as much as black people, except for another piece of the legislation, which gave voting rights to all people who were legally able to vote on or before 1867, or whose ancestors were able to vote on or before 1867. As you might suspect, the constitutional amendment giving black people the right to vote went into effect after 1867. Jim Crow had come to North Carolina. If you're like me, you might be surprised by this story. First, there was a successful coup d'etat in the United States. Didn't learn about that in school. But secondly, the timeline. North Carolina didn't fully deny black people the right to vote until after 1900. It was 35 years after the Civil War. Back when I was learning US history, I sort of got the impression that the Civil War ended, black people had the right to vote for a few seconds, and then pretty much instantly it was gone. Turns out what happened in the last decades of the 19th century was much more complicated and it took a lot more time. In this episode, we're going to explore how in the last three decades of the 19th century, many, but not all, white Americans, most of whom were Christians, defined citizenship as belonging to white people and defined the country as, in essence, a white Christian nation. As it became apparent in 1864 and 1865 that the North would win the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln turned his attention to the post-war nation. On what basis would secessionists be allowed back in the Union? What would be the conditions for national reconciliation? What about slaves? And was this the moment to erase race as a basis for rights? When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April 1865, the slavery question had one clear answer. The 13th Amendment passed before Lincoln's death abolished slavery. All the other questions, particularly about the rights of black people and whether a full citizenship would be race-based, remained open, North and South. Before the war, many white Northerners had opposed slavery while also denying black people could be full citizens or that the United States could ever be a multiracial nation. Before the war, black people could not vote in all, all northern states. In Minnesota, they couldn't vote until 1868. And certainly many white southerners had no desire to see former slaves or free black people as citizens. 
Indeed, immediately following the war, many southern states passed so-called black codes that allowed black people some rights slaves hadn't had, the right to marry, to own property, and to sign contracts, but denied black people the right to vote or to testify in court against someone who was white. Oh, and the bit about signing contracts? The black codes mandated that black people sign yearly labor contracts with white people. So that was really a right to sign up for your own indentured servanthood. In some states, black codes made black children subject to involuntary apprenticeships, meaning they were separated from their parents and sent to work for white people, a system bearing a striking resemblance to slavery. After the war, some Americans, many of them black but some white, contended that the time had come to remake the nation as truly interracial, committed to civic and political equality for black and white citizens. In a funeral sermon for Abraham Lincoln, white Methodist minister Gilbert Haven called on the nation to finish what he took to be Lincoln's agenda for the end of the war. Haven declared that it was time to confer equal citizenship upon all of the nation and argued that voting rights for former slaves would prevent the half a million former aristocrats of the South from vaulting into authority again. Northern missionaries who went to help free people after the war, at least in some cases, also made the case for, inter for an interracial nation. Some black northern missionaries made that case by protesting against discrimination. Sarah Stanley, an African-American woman, a graduate of Oberlin College and a missionary to free people between 1864 and 1868, protested when white members of her mission failed to treat black people as equals when they, say, objected to white and black missionaries living in the same mission houses, or in Stanley's own case, black and white people marrying each other. On the other hand, some white missionaries also argued for the full humanity and political equality of black people. Here, the record is complicated. Certainly, some white missionaries had racist and condescending attitudes towards black people. That's why people like Sarah Stanley complained. But, as historian Ed Bloom argues, some of the white missionaries who stayed in the South for longer periods of time came to see black people as social and political equals. They made the case for political equality through letters, magazine articles, and books. Linda Slaughter, for example, published a book about missions to free people in the South in 1869. Slaughter could be condescending in her language, but she ended her book by printing verbatim the speech of H.M. Turner, a black man, on why Georgia should allow black men to be in the legislature. Her book's last paragraphs commended the speech. She called the free people citizens of the restored union and the republic's true home-born sons, and asserted that they would faithfully and intelligently discharged their sacred trust. Congress, too, had an interracial vision for Reconstruction. Well, at least enough members of Congress had something enough of a similar vision that they got stuff done. That must have been nice. Anyway, after two years of Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, largely allowing the South to do what it wanted, Congress took over reconstructing the South. This was the period known as Radical Reconstruction, and it lasted from 1867 to 1872. Among the conditions that Congress set for Southern states to establish their own governments were the guarantee of universal male suffrage or voting rights without regard to race, and the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed birthright citizenship and equal protection of the law for all Americans. The Reconstruction Congress also passed the 15th Amendment, which stipulated that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That amendment also guaranteed voting rights for African Americans in the North, where, again, 
Even after the Civil War, not all states had allowed black people to vote. During Reconstruction, over 2,000 African Americans held public office. They served as local officials in state legislatures and in the United States Senate. They also voted in huge numbers, exercising long denied rights. But those rights in the South did not last. In 1877, Republican and Northerner Ruther B. Hayes gained the presidency after a contested election and a compromise. In four states, both parties claimed that their candidate had won, throwing the proper winner of those electoral votes into doubt. Hayes made a deal for the votes. As president, Hayes would remove the last U.S. troops from former Confederate states and would not interfere with how Southern states dealt with black people. It was a compromise with devastating effects for black people in the South. Reconstruction was over. According to white Southerners, redemption, that's the term they used, had begun. Redemptionists sought to redeem the South from what they often called Negro rule although black people had never made up a majority of any Southern government. Redemption for these Southerners had begun during Reconstruction, as groups like the Ku Klux Klan used violence to fight against black people's rights. Redemption continued after Reconstruction, as state after state, Southern Democrats took charge of state governments and instituted rules like those that North Carolina passed in 1900 to limit or prohibit black people from voting. Calling this process redemption signaled that it was, for many white Southerners, a religious undertaking. Just as many white Southerners, as we saw in previous episodes, declared that slavery was the will of God, they now claimed that white supremacy and racial segregation were the will of God. A quick note here. White Southerners in the late 19th century and folks defending them ever since have maintained that the Civil War wasn't about slavery or white supremacy, but about states' rights. States' rights, however, were largely important owing to slavery. Also, the leaders of the Confederacy were not exactly subtle about the central role race played in the creation of their nation. Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, declared in a famous speech our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition. So the Confederacy had not just lost a war fought for states' rights, but had lost one fought for white supremacy. One possible interpretation of that defeat was that God opposed white supremacy, and that's why the South had lost. But that's not the reading many white Southerners gave to the war. Instead, they created what has become known as the religion of the lost cause. The religion of the lost cause wasn't a religion in the sense that you could go down the street to the first religion of the lost cause. The religion of the lost cause didn't have a denominational headquarters or a hymn book. It was actually more pervasive than that. The religion of a lost cause was a shared system of beliefs and understandings that you could find in many white Southern churches. The religion of a lost cause claimed that the slave South had been a godly society, that the Confederate army had been a godly army fighting for a godly cause, that God had allowed Southern defeat to purify or strengthen white Southerners, and that God now wanted white Southerners to redeem the South from the black and Northern infidels who were intent on reconstructing it along interracial lines. Just as Christ's suffering brought redemption, so too with the suffering of the white South, both during the war and during reconstruction. Lost cause adherents argue that the apparent failure in war was no sign of God's disapproval. As Wade Hampton, a former, former Confederate general and South Carolina politician, asked rhetorically, when our divine master perished on the cross, did the doctrines for which he died perish with him? 
For Hampton and other adherents of the lost cause, the answer was clearly no. Jesus has definitely seemed like a failure, just like the Confederacy only seemed like a failure. Now, the job of white Christians was to resurrect the doctrine of white supremacy in the South. One way of emphasizing the righteousness of the white Southern way of life was to portray Southern military leaders as righteous. Robert E. Lee particularly was divinized. He, like other Confederate heroes, was also immortalized in statue. In the decades following the Civil War, groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy erected statues that showed Confederate leaders as noble, brave figures. These statues were erected as black people were increasingly being denied rights, and that wasn't an accident. The statues literally marked the South as belonging to those who fought for or sympathized with the Confederacy. In 1913, for example, Julian Carr celebrated the installation of Silent Sam, a statue that, until 2018, stood on the University of North Carolina campus. Carr lauded what the Confederate soldier meant to the welfare of the Anglo-Saxon race during the four years immediately succeeding the war, when the facts are that their courage and steadfastness saved the very life of the Anglo-Saxon race in the South, when the bottom rail was on top all over southern states. Confederate soldiers, according to Carr, rightly ensured that black people lost their rights and that the South did not become interracial. To emphasize his point, he told a story about coming home from the war and horsewhipping, and that's his term, a black woman until her skirts hung in shreds because the black woman publicly insulted and maligned a Southern lady. The statutes were not artifacts of the war. They weren't, for example, like battlefields that marked historic events during the war, but they were statements about who should be able to commit violence with impunity, who should have rights, and who should be in charge of a redeemed South. As so-called redemption took hold in the South, African Americans paid high prices. They lost rights, the right to vote, to hold office, to be on juries. With the loss of these rights went basic protections against oppression. Politicians tend to care about people who can vote for them. By depriving black people of the vote, Southern governments made certain that the good of black people would not be a serious consideration for elected officials. Some white Southerners also used violence as a tool to enforce racial norms. Lynchings multiplied. Historians estimate that starting in 1889, around 100 people were lynched every year. White people defended lynching, or in some cases failed to strongly condemn them, by claiming that they were responses to the rape of white women by black men. That claim has been debunked repeatedly, first in 1892, when the black journalist Ida B. Wells published Southern Horrors. Her investigation revealed that only a third of lynchings was the victim even accused of rape. As Wells pointed out, lynchings were best explained by the well-known opposition growing out of slavery to the progress of the race. Lynchings were a horrific means to ensure adherence to white rule and to punish those who made any attempt or were suspected of making any attempt of thwarting it. Lynching and the response of white Americans, particularly white Christian Americans, to them tells us a lot about race and religion at the end of the 19th century. It tells us that many white Christians saw black people as fundamentally different and fundamentally less than white people. We can see that in the most egregious actions, like white Christians who joined crowds of spectators to watch while fellow human beings were tortured and killed in front of them. We can see it in the lynching as a response to rape's greatest hypocrisy, one Wells pointed out. During both slavery and Reconstruction, white men had raped black women, but they were rarely punished, much less lynched. Black women were simply seen as less valuable, less human than white women. Crimes against them didn't matter. We can also see the refusal to acknowledge the full humanity of black people and the responses of people who never would have attended a lynching, 
People like one of the most famous and powerful public Christians of the 19th century, Women's Christian Temperance Union President Frances Willard. Willard condemned mob violence, and her organization condemned lynching. But she also maintained that lynching was the result of the rape of white women by black men. Ida B. Wells, armed with her research, publicly disputed Willard's claims. Willard refused to believe Wells' evidence. Willard simply could not believe that any white woman would willingly have sex with a black man. Willard could not see black people as fully people, as people with whom someone might want to have an equal mutual relationship. That lynchings continued unimpeded also tells us that white northerners, many again were Christian, had decided that reconciliation with white southerners was more important than the rights and the lives of black southerners. At the end of the 19th century, most white northerners were not willing to intervene in the South to stop lynching or any other form of white supremacy. Again, Willard was a case in point. Her Women's Christian Temperance Union, which fought for the prohibition of alcohol, was the largest women's organization in the country. It allowed segregated chapters. If that was the price of having white Southern women in the WCTU, Willard would allow it. Or to take another example, Dwight Moody, the most famous evangelist of the late 19th century, during the height of his popularity, allowed his revivals to be segregated in the South. He changed course in the mid-1890s, but only after his popularity and influence had waned. For Willard and for Moody, if segregation of the races was the price to pay for the reconciliation of white Northerners and white Southerners, they were willing to pay it. Of course, neither Willard or Moody really paid that price. They were popular and lauded in their time. Black Southerners paid the price. And for that matter, I think you could say that the truth of the gospel paid the price. The reconciliation between white Northerners and white Southerners was a reconciliation without repentance, without changed lives, or at least without significant change on the issue of treating black people, many of whom, again, were brothers and sisters in Christ, as people bearing the image of God. White Christians, North and South, focused on other kinds of changes wrought by conversion, giving up drinking, for example, but not on loving black people. And that in itself was telling. Frances Willard's stand against having a beer with dinner was more unequivocal than her stance against white supremacy. And many Christians followed her lead. In 1909, Methodist minister Lucius Hosley described the impossible situation black people were in the South. Good breeding, politeness, kindness, self-respect, and all the virtues may be added and retained by a black man. But these, instead of helping him to live in the esteem of his white neighbor, actually put him in a precarious condition and endanger his life and property. For many years, Hostley had preached moderation and working hard not to anger white people in the South. Over time, he learned a hard lesson. Some white Southerners dressed up their opposition to black people voting or holding office in the guise of wanting respectable people in charge of civic life. Their language suggested that if African Americans would, say, go to school, go to college, hold jobs, and have stable families, they would someday be ready for civic life. Possibly decided that that was a lie. Black people in the South did go to school and college. They held jobs. They married and had children. They joined the Women's Christian Temperance Union in segregated chapters. And it didn't matter in the least. White Southerners did not want black people to have a voice in government. Their opposition was about race, not readiness. Many white Southerners embedded that opposition in Christian language about a godly civilization that had been lost through war but redeemed through the reassertion of white power. Other white Christians may not have used that language, but they certainly didn't shut it down. Whether through omission or commission, 
these Christians claimed that the country was really for and about white people. The nation, the nation that mattered, the nation where voting rights and due process applied, the nation worth defending, that was the white nation. It was an old lie, but it remained one not a few white Christians in America would kill to defend.